so so what is what are rules uh, rules are an important part of common sense reasoning and they are sometimes com uh, confused with the idea of uh, logic but they are not exactly the same as classical logic implications uh, let's see an example right when you say that fire causes a smoke or if you want to write it this way a smoke if fire you are actually providing a rule that says that something produces an effect in logic programming notation this if i wrote before is written in this way so we will write colon dash and uh, in the in the slides, I'm going to use this leftwards implication in order to write rules in a more, um, let's say, formula-like style. When we talk about rules in logic programming, we have the head, which is the consequence or the left part of the rule. And we have the body that may have more elements, more than one atom. And this is what we call the body and is the antecedent of the rule. When you see a rule, you have two possible readings. The first uh, reading, which is more or less the, the causal reading, is um, using the rule for firing the rule. And this is what we call the bottom-up reading of a rule. If I make a fire, I will get the smoke as a byproduct. So this is nothing else but uh, what we call modus ponens application in logic. Okay, so we have the implication, we have the antecedent, so we can conclude the consequent. And this is an inference rule, right? As I said before, this is, this is called modus ponens. The other way of reading the rule is as a way to achieve a goal. So uh, how can I get the smoke? Think about the, the Native American that was sending messages. So the, the goal was sending the message in order to send the messages he had to, uh, to cause some smoke. And one way to get the smoke is making a fire. So if I think about the goal is smoke, I look at my available uh, rules and I see that I have this rule. I know that my new goal is uh, putting a fire, making a fire, right? And then I, I go on, I look for more and more rules in order to um, get the effort of fire. In this case, fire was a fact. It, it was something that I had for free. So I got success, but I could have all the rules saying like fire if a spark, and a spark if uh, I don't know something else, right? So uh, you may imagine that these two readings um, give give rise to two different orientations in logic programming. The first reading has to do more with causal inference, and you may think uh, that answer set programming uh, uses this reading. So the reading of the rule is bottom up. The rules are made, are used to produce effects. And this is very related to a causal rule. Whereas this goal-oriented uh, backtracking procedure where you, you look for a goal and then you look for new goals until you get the, the, the final objective is the one that we use in uh, the logic programming language Prolog. So we will focus in the bottom up application of rules. The first choice is um, translating the rule as a material implication in classical logic. So the obvious way of seeing this implication here is as a classical implication. And as we know, the classical implication is nothing else but a disjunction. So fire causes smoke is seen as not fire or smoke. The good thing about using uh, material implication is that modus ponens is granted. So this is something we have for free. But the bad thing is that when we look at the models of the formula, uh, they are not aligned with the way in which we reason when we use rules. So suppose that we only have this piece of information in our um, knowledge base. So we know that the fire causes the smoke, but we don't have any other information. In, in rule-based reasoning, we would expect that a fire were false because we don't have uh, any piece of information about that. There is no way to derive fire. And since fire is false, we cannot fire the rule. And so smoke is also false because the smoke is only derivable with this rule, right? 
So in rule-based reasoning, with this only rule, we shouldn't derive anything in particular. Whereas in classical models, if we look at these disjunctions here, we have three possible models. It's, it is a disjunction, so well, we have that uh, is going to be true when the left part is true, when the right part is true, or, or when both of them are true. So the three models, uh, from the three models, only one of them actually coincides with the idea we said before in rule-based reasoning, that is when all the atoms are false, but we also have other models where, as you see, we arbitrarily uh, assign true to the atom smoke, right? It is interesting to see that this model is also a minimal model in the sense that it is the one that has less number or less set of true atoms. So this is an interesting observation. And uh, uh, if you look at more examples like this, you will see that normally uh, the rule-based reasoning um, behavior coincides with this uh, minimal model. A minimal model also cover something um, that is a little bit more complicated, that is positive recursion in a nice way. Let's see an example of rules talking about positive recursion. Look at these two gear rules, the two gear wheels. We have a wheel A and a wheel B. If you don't do anything, and you have these two rules saying that when I, I activate um, will be, uh, then will A will spin and the other way around, right? Because if you move one of them, the other one will move. It doesn't matter which, which of them you, you activate. But if you have these two rules and nothing else happens, you would expect that the, that the two wheels uh, shouldn't move, right? Once you add a fact here, like saying, for instance, spin A, then immediately the rules activate and the, and the other uh, wheel should move. So once again, if you look at this as uh, classical implications, uh, you have two models, right? Because here you have the double implication, spin A if and only if spin B. And the double implication has two models. Either uh, the two atoms are true or the two atoms are false. And as I said before, once again, um, the minimal model seems to capture very well the idea of using this implication as rules. So uh, from, from this informal explanation, we do go into a little bit of formality. We talk about a positive logic program. A positive logic program is a set of rules uh, of this form where you have a head that is an atom, you have a body that is a, a list of atoms separated by commas and that, that are understood as conjunctions. And you have the if symbol that in logic programming uh, notation is uh, this one here, right? We may have zero atoms in the body. When this is the case, then we only have a head that we normally we don't write the arrow and this is called a fact, okay? The ordering is not relevant. This is something that changes from prolog. If you are used to prolog, the ordering, of course, is relevant because Prolog has the rules plus and um, control flow ordering. But in, in answer set programming, um, the ordering among the atoms in the body is irrelevant. And also the ordering of the rules is uh, irrelevant as well. So it doesn't matter the order um, among rules or atoms in the body. Uh, this I said before, when n is zero, you don't have a body, you don't, um, you don't draw this, uh, this arrow here. So uh, for semantics, what we, we can do is apply this minimality, the, the, taking the minimal model as we said before. So we start reading this rule as this in classical logic implication. And we apply what is called the closed world assumption that is assuming that we make uh, um, as, as true atoms, as less true atoms as possible. So we have to take minimal models, right? Uh, in general, in any formula, you may have several different minimal models. Think about a disjunction. In a disjunction, you have three possible models and there are two possible minimal models. 
But in the case of positive programs, where you don't have the junction, actually, you only have this kind of uh, clauses here. This, these clauses are called horn clauses in, in classical logic. You always have at least a minimal model. So there is a unique uh, model that is smaller than all, that all the rest. And this is going to be written like this, least model of the program P. As an example, here you may have this set of implications and you may believe me or otherwise, we, we, we will try later on how, how to see that the minimal model is this one, but it's, it's easy to see because P and Q are facts, so they have to be in any model. And then you, once you know that these uh, true atoms are, uh, these two atoms are true, uh, then you can go seeing that S has to be true because Q is true and so on. So the, the models of this set of implications are PQRS, P, PQRS AB, and also ABC. So as you can see, there is a minimal model, that's a model that is included in all the rest. There is a least model. Uh, this least model can be easily computed by fighting the rules. This is more or less what I uh, did before informally. The, um, this is an application of a deductive closure uh, and actually corresponds formally to what is called the immediate consequences operator that was defined by Van Endem and Kowalski in 1976. That was the basis of the logical semantics for logic programming. Um, the formal definition of the immediate consequences operator is, is this one. You take the heads of all rules for which the body is true with respect to some um, propositional interpretation. So the immediate consequences operator takes a set of true atoms and returns a new set of true atoms. Okay. So for those rules whose body um, are true in the interpretation that is the parameter of the of the operator, you take the set of heads. And this operator can be applied iteratively on the um, on the empty set interpretation. So you would start from, I don't know anything. You start applying the operator. In the first pass of the operator, the only rules that have a true body are the facts. And, uh, and from this, you would go on applying the operator until you reach a fixed point, okay? So this is formally. Informally, it's just fighting the rules, right? So it's, it's just, <laughs> you, you see lucky, uh, lucky uh, look there fighting, right? So you start with the facts, as I said before, P and Q. And now the next step is looking at the bodies that become true. And as you can see, this body is not true yet because I don't have P, but this body has all it, uh, its atoms true. So the rule is fire and I get P, Q and S, right? And now I see which new bodies become true. In this case, this new body is true. So P, P and S fires and I get R. And finally, I reach this point where I have true P, Q, S and R, but as you can see, A depends on B, B depends on A and A depends on C. There is no way uh, to fire these rules, right? So if you apply the operator here, to PQSR, you get PQSR again. So you reach the fixed point, as I said before. So this fixed point is the least fixed point of the operator. And the main theorem proved by Van Endemann Kowalski in 1976 is that this least model actually coincides with a fixed point. One interesting observation is that there is something else here. And uh, it has to do with uh, um, explainable, explainable AI, right? With ex explaining the, the result for each atom you get in this fixed point, by the way you have got it, you have a proof for the atom. So you can reconstruct the proof for each true atom using modus ponens. It's just looking at the rules that you uh, went firing in a tree-like style. For instance, why is R true? And if you look at it, R was true because of this rule and that you got P as a fat and that you got S from this other rule. 
and you got Q as a factor. So you have a tree-like justification. You actually may have several uh, tree-like uh, justifications because it may be easily the case that you may derive a same atom from different, uh, from different proofs in the same program, right? You may have several alternative ways of getting an atom. Uh, so as, as I told you in the Slack um, chat, we can try, we can play a, a bit with the example. Um, for those that have uh, um, downloaded the code, um, I have put several pieces of answer set programming code uh, that are called by the number of the slides. So you should have there something called proc12.lp in the code.zip file. And it should look something like this, right? So this, you can believe it, is the program I showed in the slides, okay? And we can try it using the tool Klingo um, and the name of the program, right? As you can see, if you write Klingo and the name of the program, we get one answer with the least model, PQRS. You don't have to have all the atoms uh, alphabetically ordered. Uh, there is some information saying that, see, there is no way to derive C because it is not in any rule head, but this is a warning, right? So this is something trivial. If C is not in any rule head, it's going to be false because you don't have a rule to derive it. Uh, maybe it is interesting to use Klingo to tell us all the possible models of this program. And this can be done saying Klingo zero and then proc12.lp. And as you can see, there is only one answer, right? We only get one uh, list model from this program. Now, let, let me have a look at the, at the chat to see whether there is any question right now. Mm. I lost, I lost the chat, but I guess uh, the chair can help. Are there any questions? I guess not, okay. So one interesting thing is that you can force to get the classical models very easily so that if we uncomment the first line, you see that uh, the first line starts with a percentage symbol. This means that this is, a, this is a comment. So if I remove the percentage symbol, I am telling Klingo that all these atoms in this list among brackets, this, is, this will be explained uh, later on, but right now we may think that I am telling that all these atoms do not follow the closed wall assumption. So they should not be minimized. They're going to be treated as classical uh, atoms. So if, if I, I make this change and I call Klingo again, you may see that you see the three classical models I was saying before, right? So, uh, by making this, let's say, open these atoms or removing the closed wall assumption from this, uh, for these atoms, I can see the classical models of uh, Klingo rules understood as implications. And as you can see very easily, here uh, it happens what I said before, right? The least model is exactly this, the least model. is included in all the rest of models. Okay, this was a little experiment. And I encourage you to go on and try other experiments like this. So the next step is introducing the full negation. So the full negation is not a normal negation. It's used in order to write a very important, a very important kind of reason that, that are default rules, rules that act when you don't have information about something, okay? Uh, we already have some uh, default falsity in closed wall assumption because any atom that there is no way to derive uh, is false by default. But the bad thing with closed wall assumption is that we cannot check the falsity of an atom in a rule. So the obvious thing to do is adding a negative literal, right? 
So in the bodies, uh, apart from atoms, we can write now the negation of the, an atom, and it should be understood as there is no evidence or there is no proof. If you want to think about in terms of justification, there is no justification for P. I cannot, I cannot find a method to derive P. Sometimes the full negation is also called um, negation as failure. Uh, although I prefer the name default because the failure procedure looks like more an algorithm, right? And default is something uh, more semantic. Uh, another alternative reading I'm going to use in the talk is reading not P. When I, when I use the, the text not, I am assuming that this is the full negation. Reading that as uh, the negation of P is a valid assumption. And, and this is something I will uh, go into detail later on. Okay. So now we call normal logic program to a set of rules of this shape where I have added negative literals in the body. And again, you have to think that the ordering among the literals is not relevant. Okay. When you don't have negations, you have the situation uh, we had before, you have a positive rule. Let's put an example. So imagine that I, I want to apply this default. I normally fill the tank if it is empty and there is no evidence on fire. I see that there is no uh, any information telling me that there could be a fire around. Okay. This doesn't mean the same. This is not the same that being quite positive, sure that there is no fire. It's just, I don't have any evidence of that, okay? So we can write the rule fill if empty and not fire. And so, suppose that the tank is actually empty indeed, okay? So the expected behavior here, you have this pair of rules, the natural thing, the natural way of thinking when you have uh, rule-based reasoning is I have no evidence of fire, right? I don't have any rule that can make fire true. Since I have no evidence of fire, this becomes true. And as empty is true, I should get the conclusion empty and filled. This is the only model I expect from this program. But again, uh, I get into a problem. The, the reading of my theory, that is the fact empty and the implication empty at not fire implies fill, uh, doesn't work well when I use classical models. Moreover, it doesn't work, work well either if I use the closed wall assumption. And that, that was a qu quite, a, quite an important problem in order to look for the semantics of negation. Why is this so? Because this implication here is actually equivalent to a disjunction, right? It's empty, empty is true, so you can remove this. And now not fire or fill is nothing else but fill or fire. And now the minimal models you can imagine is empty fill and empty fire. So this one, the second model is quite surprising, right? If you think of, uh, about the, the theory in terms of rules, uh, getting a fire when you didn't have a rule to derive it is very surprising. It's not that it's not uh, okay to assume that you have a fire, but the problem is that you cannot build a proof for fire. And a key point here is in, in answer set programming is that any assumption you make must be eventually justified. This is a TV series I like a lot. So another interesting observation is that we expect non-monotonic behavior. What does non-monotonic mean? It means that something that was derived before can be withdrawn if new information appears. So in our previous theory, if somebody tell us, or I can observe that there is a fire, we shouldn't derive an empty field anymore. The conclusion field is not valid anymore. And now we should move into the, the other model, empty fire, and retract the conclusion field. So things are really complicated here because I see several things that are not easy to capture in classical logic. First, the disjunction. Second, the, this non-monotonic behavior that I never have in classical logic because classical logic is monotonic. This means that any conclusions you have, if you add more information, they will be there 
forever. No? You keep adding information and all the conclusions you had before are maintained. So I like to see this problem as a, as a problem of directionality of material implication. Uh, and this is very easily revealed because this implication, as I said before, is the same as this one. But in classical logic, it's also the same as this other one. And this is surprising, right? Because this other one, if it were read as a rule, it would look like this. You will have a fire if the tank is empty and there is no evidence that you feel it. So from a causal reading perspective, it doesn't make sense at all, right? <laughs> so if I have no evidence of filling the, 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 the tank, and the tank is empty, suddenly I get a fire. So this is clearly something quite different to the rule I had before. So they, they should have a quite different meaning, right? And this is not granted by classical logic. Just to play a bit with it, we can take the example 18. And uh, if you write Klingo 0 proc 18.lp, Oh, maybe it's not that page because I made changes. It could be 17, right? I may have changed a last moment page number. Okay, so um, this is the program I had there. As you can see, we have fill if empty and not fire. The, the, the tank is empty. The conclusion I get is empty fill. We can see what happens if we convert all these atoms into classical atoms by removing the first comment. The first comment, so I remove the comment in the first line. And I call Klingo again. As you can see, I have many models, right? The one I wanted is that the, that the tank is empty. I, I can safely fill. But I also have models in which suddenly a fire appears, right? Another experiment you may run is just remove the first line, but add, add the fact that you can observe a fire, right? And now, as you, as you can see, your tank is empty. There is a fire, but you don't feel it. So this illustrates the non-monotonic behavior. So things uh, are not so easy in order to model this kind of behavior. More or less, it is quite intuitive, but sometimes we can form some kind of paradoxical uh, set of rules. Uh, first of all, rules may be conflicting. There is a classical example in the fall reasoning called the Nixon's diamond. Uh, the diamond thing is because you can form a graph that looks like the diamond. And it goes like this. Uh, Quakers normally are pacifist unless they are bellicose, right? unless you can prove that they are bellicose. So this would be pacifist if Quaker, and you cannot prove that uh, bellicose. Republicans are normally bellicose unless they are pacifist. So this would be the rule B if R and not be. And uh, the, key, the particular case of, of Richard Nixon is that he was both a Quaker and a Republican. So with these two facts here, you enter into a problem because P if not P, but B if not P. So there is no constructive way to apply the rules. So there is a loop through negation and there have, you have to make a decision, right? There are several possibilities in the literature to deal with conflicting defaults, but we have to say what happens in this particular case. As we will see next in the case of answer set programming, where you have this kind of um, duality, you actually get two possible solutions. So you, you, you deviate from the behavior of Prolog, where you always have a one canonical model, and here you may use several different models. Uh, the formal definition of, of, um, of the semantics of answer set programming is based on the semantics of a stable model that was defined by Gelfand and Lifshin in 1988. And you can see 
at, as a three-step procedure, right? Of course, uh, you can look at the paper or many, many papers that make the formal, the formal definition. I'm going to make an, an informal one. So the first step is like if you have a glass uh, ball, like a uh, telltaler, right? And you guess an assumption. So give me a model you think could be the case. So you put some true atoms there. This is your assumption. And right now you have P, Q, R. So right now your assumption for negations are that B is false, right? Because it's not in the, in the crystal ball. So the next step is go to the program and simplify all the negations uh, accordingly to your assumption. So you reduce the program nodes. So you reduce the negations of the program. You remove them depending on this. So not V is true and uh, not P is false. So if you have false in a condition, the rule is not applicable. And if you have true in a condition, you can remove the true. So this program is what is called the reduct or the reduct with respect to this assumption in the crystal ball. And now this problem is going to be positive because you don't have negations anymore. So you can compute the least model or you can compute the fixed point as we did before. Uh, the third step is checking that what you prove here is compatible with your assumption. So the minimal model here is PQR. So this is what I get in the reduct. And this is exactly what I had in the assumption. So when this happens, I say that the model is stable. So your assumption, you, you made some assumptions. You check that they can be proved. And if the, the, what you prove coincides with your assumption, everything is okay. Let's see, uh, by symmetry, you can think that this example had a second stable model, the, just because it is completely analogous, the program is symmetric, and you get the other stable model, BQR. So essentially, you get two stable models where Nixon is, of course, Quaker and Republican because those were facts, but you also have that sometimes he's pacifist, in some models he may be pacifist, and in other models it, it, he may be uh, bellicose, right? Let's see an example of something that is not a stable model. So suppose that your assumption looked like this. So right now, your negation, your um, negated assumption is R is false. We go into the program in both negations here are, are false, right? Because the only negation that you assume false is R. So the two rules disappear. And the only thing you can prove is QR, whereas your assumption was B, P, and Q. So this is unstable. And this is unstable for several reasons, right? First, you have assumed P and B, and there is no way to derive them. So they are unjustified. But there is another reason as well, is that your assumption, not R, is refuted because you derive R. And this second reason is stronger in this case, because look, R was a fact in your program. So you started very badly, assuming that R is going to be false. So no, there is no going to be ever any assumption that will work uh, using not R, provided that R is a fact in the program, right? So these kind of uh, things, this kind of shortcuts, may simplify the computation. So don't think this as the way in which uh, the Klingo tool computes the stable models. It's a way of thinking about the meaning of the stable model. But of course, this is not a method because you would have to make the assumptions always. And sometimes you don't have to make any assumption at all, right? Uh, okay, I had this example in order to show what. Uh, yeah, no monotonicity, but I think we, we already showed it before. You can try here to add more rules to see that things uh, may change, but I, I, I will skip this example. So any questions until now? Okay, I see no, no questions.
Uh, yeah, I didn't explain what is an statified, so I will skip this. But sometimes you may have the case that some programs don't even have any stable model at all, even if they have a classical model. And let me put an example of this using a classical paradox by Bertrand Russell. Uh, this is a variant of the famous Russell's paradox uh, that looks like this. I want to um, uh, compile, I want to get, collect a catalog that cites all books without self citations. So a book has a self citations. If in the middle of the book, you can read uh, the title of the book. For instance, El Quixote has a self citation because talks about the book inside the book. So imagine that I have this list of books here and all these books do not cite themselves. So I put them in my catalog, A, B and D are going to be in my catalog, but my catalog uh, will have a title, let's say it, it is C, and I have to collect all the books that do not cite themselves. So should I put C inside the catalog or not? If uh, C doesn't uh, cite itself, if I have no evidence that C is citing itself, then I should cite C in the catalog because the catalog collects all those kinds of books. But in the moment I cite C in the catalog, I have a cell citation. So this pair of rules are exactly capturing the reasoning I have in the, in the paradox. Let's see what happens if uh, you try Program 23A, Klingo Zero Program 23A, because I have a second program in this page, right? As you can see, it is unsatisfiable. So it's saying that there is no way to satisfy this program. We can also do an experiment and look, oh, sorry. Look what happens if I open the two atoms as classical. So I put them in inside brackets and separated by semicolon. So now this is not going to apply logic programming semantics, it's going to use them as implications, right? In classical logic. As you can see, this is an example of uh, a theory that in classical models would have models. But under the logic programming semantics, under the stable model semantics, it doesn't make sense, right? It's this, when we have this situation, we call the program incoherent. There is an incoherence. There is no way to build a stable model here. To see that there is no way to build a stable model, uh, suppose that our assumption includes self C, right? If uh, our assumption includes self C, this is going to be false and the rule will disappear. And the only rule I get is this one. So there is no way to derive the assumption. So you made an assumption, but then you cannot justify it. The other possibility is that, that your assumption does not include self C. If that is the case, this is going to be true. And then you derive side C, but also self C, okay? And uh, this means that your initial assumption is refuted because you derive it. So you were assuming that self C uh, was not true, but by doing so, you derive self C. Okay, so it's kind of, there is a paradox here somehow. So it's not so strange that uh, you don't get a stable model. Let's see even an even simpler example uh, and think about these people that have some kind of psychological problem. So that when they don't have a problem, that generates for them a problem. So they always have to have a problem, right? If they don't have a problem, that is also a problem. So this would be this kind of rule. And as you can imagine, this loop is going to behave in the same way. So a simple, very, very simple loop like this will get the program not to be um, coherent unless we have all the atoms for problem, right? Unless we have all the rules for problem. Okay, and that, that should be uh, program 23. If you can, if you want to try it, is program 23B. You can try also adding the fact problem and see that the problem disappears because it, it becomes a fact, right? 
Okay, so one thing we can do is to exploit this behavior of negative cycles in the following way. Uh, the even or the, the, the even uh, negative cycles, things like the Nixon diamond, can be used to generate multiple alternatives. For instance, uh, it can be used to generate non determined when you have a fire, sometimes you get a spark. Oh, sorry, the other way around, sorry. When you make a spark, sometimes you get a fire, right? But sometimes no. So one way to do that is using an auxiliary atom, AUX, so that you have fire if a spark, and you cannot prove AUX. And then use the auxiliary atom here and say AUX if a spark, and you cannot prove fire. So this is the Nixon diamond playing here with an auxiliary atom to generate two possibilities, right? If you try it, I don't know if this one, I have it there or not. It's not so difficult to write. So if you, you can try this program and you will see that you will have these two uh, answers. It's spark fire and a spark aux, okay? Um, of course, in this case, the auxiliary atoms is not interesting to be shown, so you can, use the uh, show directive in order to tell which atoms you want to see. So if we say that we only want to see atom fire and spark, we would actually have these two answer sets. This is a common abbreviation of this kind of construct I, be, I will begin using. So rather than using this loop, you can write it this way. If the spark is true, then you have the option. So these brackets here in the logic program, in, in the logic programming syntax, mean that you have the option to fire on. And also you can use these things to dismiss stable models when a condition holds. Why? Because we can use the Russell's paradox program or the problem if not problem in order to forbid this combination of atoms. I don't want any stable model where wet is true and fire is true. In order to reject this possible stable model, what I will do is build in this loop here. So this is also so common that we just normally write this thing here in this way. So we just put a rule without a head. Um, I think I'm going to skip this slide because we are going a little bit slow. So this is sample, I will skip it. It has to do with computation of the stable models. Unless somebody wants wants me to to explain something about the splitting, but if there are no um, there are no questions, I will skip this part. Uh, deciding whether a propositional normal program with negation has some stable model is an NP complete problem. So the complexity we have here right now is NP uh, completeness. What about uh, a possible logical encoding of this. Why do I say logical encoding? Because right now, as you have seen, the definition of a stable model relies on a syntactic transformation and the interpretation of rules, we don't know very well what they are, right? Sometimes, in some part of the definition, they are classical implications, at least when I compute the least model, but uh, when I, I make the assumption they are not, they do not look like classical implications. And uh, a very good logical characterization of a stable models is what I'm going to explain next is equilibrium logic. So the stable models definition is syntactically limited because we have a syntactic transformation and we don't have the definition for things like this, negating a rule. What does this mean, right? This is out of the scope of the definition I have said. So you cannot freely combine any connective. Uh, there are, later, reader, uh, there are later, later definitions of stable models that go incorporating new things. Like for instance, this is very common nowadays. You have a disjunction in the head. You can use disjunction in the head. And farther, farther later on, you, you can nest conjunction, disjunction and negation, both in the, in the head and in the body. Uh, this is an example of a disjunction in the head. We can see it. Uh, this is, if, if I fill the tank and I don't have a Boucher for not paying, I have to pay with card or with credit card or maybe in cash, okay? 
So here I generate these two possibilities. And the way in which this is interpreted is exactly as before. We compute the, redu the reduct of the program, but now the program have, may have disjunctions. It's not a positive program. So it doesn't have a least model anymore. It has several minimal models. The only thing we require is that the assumption we use to build the readout is one of those minimal models, right? So if we try this program here, this is page 28. As you can see, we, we get two possibilities that you, uh, sorry. In the program, I have added the, the fat fill in order to fire the rule. So if I feel and I have no evidence of having a Boucher, and then you have this, this junction here is represented with a semicolon. You can also use a comma, but it's a bit confusing uh, with respect to the conjunction here, okay? So we, I, I'm going to use a semicolon for a disjunction in the head. Uh, and as you can see, you have these two options, but since we get the minimal models, this is not a normal disjunction. In this particular case, it's behaving as an exclusive uh, disjunction because I'm going to take the minimal models of these two. So this is why I get cash in one of the models and credit card in the other one. But as I said before, um, okay, we have kind of an interpretation for disjunction in the head, but I don't have a full interpretation of any logical connective under, under the uh, intuition of a stable model. For instance, I cannot nest implications. I cannot negate implications and things like that. So I have a not a real uh, logical semantics for this. So in order to overcome this difficulty, we can look at equilibrium logic that generalizes stable models for arbitrary propositional theories. The idea of equilibrium logic is uh, it is a model selection criterion on top of a weaker logic than, uh, than classical uh, logic. This, and this is the intermediate logic of here and there. So you may think that this here and there logic, when you write down uh, a set of formulas, a theory, you may have several models. Some of the HT models are also classical models, but some of them are not. They are, they are models that have the form of an intuitionistic frame, okay? So equilibrium logic is a definition of a, a model selection criterion on top of this schema here. So the first thing we have is an ordering relation among models. Suppose here that I'm drawing them, the smaller ones below. I look at the minimal models here. That are these, 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 and this. And then I get only those minimal models that are also classical models. And those are the equilibrium models. We will see the formal definition next. So let's see first, how does the here and there logic look like? Uh, it is an intermediate logic, but it's the simplest intermediate logic you can form uh, that is below classical logic. Actually, it's the strongest intermediate logic that is not classical, okay? So rather than having interpretations with sets of atoms, we have a pair of sets of atoms where H stands for here and T stands for there. And the only condition we, we add for this pair to form a valid interpretation is that H has to be included in T. For instance, this could be a possible pair. H is PQ and T is PQRS. Now, if we think about the procedure we had before with the crystal ball, the, there is a, a clear identification with that procedure of this semantics where everything that you have there is assumed. Everything that you have here is what you, you were able to justify, what you were able to prove. And anything that is outside there, any atom, for instance, imagine that in your signature here, T and W is not in T, but is in the signature. So any atom outside there is false. This is a false assumption. You are assuming that these atoms are false, okay? So there is a clear identification of this structure with the procedure we saw before. This was a bit surprising, by the way, 
because you have to think that the definition of a stable model is 1988, didn't have anything to do with intermediate logics. So it, it's something, for me, it was quite, quite surprising at least. And also the, the fact that H is included in T has an intuition from this point of view, because he's saying that anything you consider proof has to be included in your assumptions. So uh, you never, you never, um, you are not going to consider something proof if it was not assumed. So this, this semantics starts from um, rejecting cases in which something uh, assumed is not eventually proved. So this is not going to happen because in the monotonic level is going to be rejected anyway, okay? Uh, of course, when you have that H is equal to T, this cannot be distinguished from a classical model that is a single set of atoms. How is the satisfaction of formulas in this uh, semantics, uh, in, this, in this logic? Well, you have to think in two, Actually, is one satisfaction relation, but you have to think in two ways of seeing it. When I say HT satisfies alpha, you have to think that the formula alpha was proved. I was able to prove the formula. Whereas when I have TT, that is when I use the second component as first component, and when this satisfies alpha, this is a classical, right? It's a classical interpretation. Uh, for me, I am going to read this as alpha is a good assumption. It's a valid assumption. You are currently assuming that alpha is true. So you, you were not, a, maybe you were not able to prove it, but at least you have assumed it. And also you have to see that when you repeat this component here, you will see that if you force, yes. Okay. If you see that you, if you force H to be equal to T, you have classical satisfaction of formulas. So how does this work? When P is an atom, HT satisfies P if P belongs to the here component, right? Conjunction and disjunction is as always. And the key point is implication. So HT satisfies alpha implies beta. And here I put two conditions. The first one is modus ponens. If alpha was proved, right? If HT satisfies alpha, then beta has to be proved as well. I fire the rule, HD satisfies beta. So the here component somehow keeps track of the application of modus ponens. And the second condition is alpha implies beta has to be a valid assumption as well. So you don't start assuming things that do not satisfy alpha implies beta. So it's kind of an economic uh, way of checking stable models, right? Why should I start from something that does not satisfy the implication from the very beginning? Okay, so the second condition is alpha implies beta has to be already true when I only use T, the assumption. The good thing is that negation is not here, as you can see, because negation is defined as a derived formula as in any other uh, intuitionistic or intermediate logic. As you know, intuitionistic logic defines negation as F implies falsum. So the, the semantics of negation is derived from the semantics of implication. This is also kind, I would say, even shocking because the history of, of logic programming has had to do with studying the meaning of uh, negation, right? The, the semantics of logic programming um, had made a lot of effort on defining different semantics for negation. Whereas in this particular logic, what we've learned is that the key point is the semantic of implication, of rules. Whereas negation is something you get as a byproduct. One interesting property you get in this logic is that uh, whenever a formula is pro, and this is, this is true for a formula, right? Not just for atoms. Any formula that is proved is also assumed. And this property here is called persistence. Another interest, uh, I, I don't know if you want me to stop on that. Or not. Seems not. Another interesting property is that the interpretation of negation is classical. So whenever you, 
if, if you want to see whether not alpha, some formula, negated formula, is proved, proving not alpha just amounts to assuming it. So there is no need to prove any negation because negations are assumptions. Okay, so this is, uh, uh, this is the definition of the here and there logic. Let's see at the definition of equilibrium logic. As I said before, equilibrium logic imposes a minimality uh, criterion on top of HT models that looks like this. A model that is classical, right? That has the form TT of a theory gamma is an equilibrium model if and only if there is no way to reduce the H component. There is no way to get a model where less atoms are proved, right? And this accounts for the closed wall assumption we had before. So there is a closed wall assumption, but on the H component, the T component is fixed, is your assumption, right? But the H component is the one that you will prove as less atoms as possible. So when this condition is satisfied, we normally say that the equilibrium model TT, that has the form of HT model, uh, is called a stable model when we only consider one of the components. Okay. All right. So um, equilibrium logic ca captures all the main uh, syntactic extension, logical extensions of logic programming uh, using propositional connectives. In fact, there is a version for first order uh, syntax. So you nowadays we have the definition of a stable models for any arbitrary first order theory with equality. Right? It also provides a, an easy way to to encode many constructs. For instance, the ones we introduced before using auxiliary atoms, uh, you don't need them in equilibrium logic because the constraints forbidding that the body uh, is true can be just represented as a negation or an implication of falsum. And uh, this uh, choice rule we had before where you can choose to put P or not in the theory is encoded in this way. I know that this, the first time you see this may be a bit strange because P or not P is the first tautology we learn each time we, uh, we are taught uh, classical logic, right? But P or not P, is not a tautology in this logic because what he's saying is that um, is that um, the atom is classical, let's say. So you are free to include the atom P as an assumption. You normally can assume not P, but you have to prove P. If you write P or not P, you, are, you can assume P as well, right? So you get assumptions also for the positive part of the, of the atom. Uh, the good thing is that with equilibrium logic, you have an interpretation for arbitrary formulas. Uh, and this is something that may be sometimes a bit shocking because what does the negation of a rule mean? Or what does the implication of something that has an implication in the body mean? There is no clear intuition about that, um, but at least you have an interpretation that is coherent with other logics. For instance, here, as you can see, HT is strictly stronger than intuitionistic logic and is strictly weaker than classical logic. And this means that when you have nested implications, negations of implications, disjunction of implications, at least you know that any intuitionistic um, tautology is also an HT tautology. So it has a behavior, let's, it, it provides somehow an intuitionistic behavior for the nesting of uh, connectives. One interesting topic that comes out um, is uh, a strong equivalence. When you have a non-monotonic um, framework like equilibrium logic, Oh, equivalence becomes tricky. And let's see an example. Imagine that somebody has written these two programs. We have a programmer A that writes empty, empty, if not fire, fill. And a second program, it has a different program that has empty and fill. If I compute uh, the stable models here in, uh, sorry, this is a mistake, right? 
this should be empty field, empty field. Okay. So I get the same stable model. This is a mistake, right? I should say. Uh, should say field, right? Okay, so apparently if they have the same, if they produce the same stable model and nothing else, one would say that these two programs are equivalent. However, if you look at them, they look like very differently. Here, the atom field could be derived thanks to the fact that they have no evidence of fire. Whereas here, field is true because it is a fact. Right. You have to fill the tank anyway. So what happens is that if you add the atom fire, the two programs behave differently, as you can imagine. Here, you add the atom fire, you never, you don't feel anymore. Whereas here, since feel is a fact, you still get empty field fire. So what has happened here? The two programs that were behaving equally, they were producing the same stable models, so you can use your program and, and give it to someone else and say, they are doing the same. But if you add more information, they start behaving differently. So the concept of a strong equivalence is, is a concept is stronger than normal equivalence. It's, just, it's not just that the stable models coincide, but you may imagine, which is the definition. P1 and P2 are strongly equivalent if P1 plus something else, Q, and P2 plus this Q have the same equilibrium models for any Q, for anything you can have. When this happens, you say that the two programs are, you can replace one by the other because the context do not affect, does not affect to the, to the replacement. Well, an interesting property of, uh, of equilibrium logic here and there in, that gave actually, that attracted the interest on this uh, characterization is that a strong equivalence of two equilibrium theories or of two programs, let's say, amounts to checking that the two theories are equivalent in the logic, in the monotonic logic of here and there. So you use, you can use the here and there logic, check whether these two programs have the same HT models, not the equilibrium models, the HT models. And if those HT models coincide, you are sure you, you, you can guarantee that the two programs are strong if you want. Okay, deciding whether a theory has some equilibrium model is sigma to p complete is actually the same complexity uh, that we get when we just add this junction in the head of normal programs, right? So up to now, I, we, we have talked about the propositional semantic of logic programming, but answer set programming is much more than that, right? Actually, it's not useful if you just play with propositional programs. So in ASP, what we do is allow general programs with predicates and variables. So you, you, you can use um, um, you can use variables inside the predicate. And we normally talk about answer sets. Actually, the difference between a stable model and answer set could be a different tutorial, right, of the name, because there are, there are many explanations of that. But you can keep the idea that once you begin playing with predicates, variables, and uh, constructs like choice rules, and you are talking about answer sets. Uh, for instance, now we can represent the Nixon's diamond in a much realistic way, where we talk about persons, right? Uh, so somebody X is a Quaker, and we cannot prove that X is bellicose, then X is pacifist. And now we say that Nixon is Republican and Nixon is Quaker, but we can also talk about other people like Bush that was a Republican. You can try this and, and see what happens, right? This is uh, program number 37. If you want, we can try it. And as you can see, uh, we get the two the two answer sets that correspond to the to the Nixon diamond. Sometimes he's bellicose, sometimes he's pacifist. But if we go into the program and we add, we uncomment the second, the last line, saying that we already have a second person. Well, here you see that Bush is always bellicose because there is no evidence about being a Quaker, right? 
So there's no evidence about being uh, uh, pacifist. So these capital letters, X, Y, etc., are variables that denote arbitrary individuals and that are going to be replaced by all the possible constants we have in the program. The, the method is much more elaborated than that. And uh, we will know soon uh, about, uh, for instance, the method that uses Gringo, because this is part of Roland Kaminsky um, uh, PhD. It's much more intelligent than that, but you can keep in mind that when you put a variable, in principle, is going to try to replace it by all the possible constant values, right? Uh, we talk, we say that an atom is ground, it, it has no variables, it only has constants, and grounding is the process of replacing variables by all the possible inter instances, right? Uh, well, I, I will not insist much on this, but there is one condition that sometimes may bother you when, when Klingo says that a variable is not safe. It's, it's not a bomb, right? The, the only thing he's saying is that uh, he has no clear hint of where to take the values of a given uh, of a given variable, right? For instance, if I go to this example, here the hint for knowing which x I have is the predicate Quaker because that is something that can look for it in the program as a list, let's say. I have a Quaker Nixon. Or if you want, let, let's think about Republican, right? I have two Republicans. So in order to say who are not pacifists, I know that I have to use the Republicans, right? But if, if I remove this hint here, and I just say, that anybody that is not pacifist is a bellicose, this X has no hint to get the value because I'm talking about any X, it's not just any person. It can be any uh, integer number, right? 34 will be bellicose if it is not pacifist. So how many elements do we have in the domain? In principle, we, of course, we, we, we have, um, um, we have a domain closure assumption, but in principle, somebody could add more elements in the future and this rule would behave differently. So if you try this program, you will get this, this mistake, right? You get that in this line, X is unsafe, it's not safe. But the, you have to read it in this way, is I have no hint of where to take the values for X. And this is very easy to solve by just telling Klingo that uh, you have to use a positive predicate in the body, and that solves the problem, okay? as I had before, or Republican, or maybe person of X, or any other, any other positive program, uh, sorry, positive predicate in the body will solve, uh, will solve the problem. Okay. Let's see a classical example. I don't know how we are going. Uh, I would like to, to end the answer set programming part before the temporal one, before the stop. I don't know if you... So, Pedro, uh, if and whenever you want, you can call a break, right? So you are welcome to carry on if you want. Otherwise, you can break at any time. Yeah, I think it's good to, to make the break when we introduce time. All right. So this is a classical example where we compute all the Hamiltonian cycles of a graph. Uh, here you have a graph, a directed graph, and a Hamiltonian cycle is something that visits all the nodes in the graph in a, in a cycle, but only once. So it's essentially is the uh, sailing uh, travel uh, traveling sales uh, person problem, but without distances, right? You don't have weights in the edges. So in order to encode this in, in answer set programming, we start describing the graph with this program here that talks about which are the vertices or the vertices of the graph, one, two, three, and four, and which are the edges. So this uh, is what we call the extensional database and describes the particular instance we want to solve. If you want to change the graph, you have to change these predicates. And this is program 39, right? Second, we have to decide how to encode the solution. 
for instance, typically we use a predicate in x, y that tell us that the edge x, y is going to be in our Hamiltonian uh, cycle solution. So what I do is I include this rule saying that for any edge, you, you are free to include in x, y. If you only write this program, you will get uh, as many solutions as possible subsets of edges you can form. You can try it. I will only, since we, we are running out of time, I will only try the final solution. But if you only write this rule on top of the other program, you will get all the possible subsets. In principle, if you have here one, two, three, four, seven edges, you should have two to the power of seven possible solutions. And now we go cutting solutions that are not valid. For instance, one thing I have to reject is branching. If I use in x, y, if I'm going to select this edge, I don't want to go to city uh, y and city z when these two cities are different. So this is rejecting possibilities where uh, you have a node and you go to, to two different nodes, right? This rule here is rejecting this possibility. And as you can see here, you have the other way around. This is rejecting the fact that you can go, you have two different incoming edges, okay? So with these two constraints, from all the possible subsets of edges I had before, I will only have now linear uh, pieces of, of uh, paths, right? Maybe they are not all of them connected. I may have some path here and then another path here, but they are not connected. So what, what I still miss is to connect all the pieces together. And to do that, I'm going to use a, a recursive predicate for economic reasons. I'm going to use uh, the idea of reaching something from one of the nodes, for instance, node number one. So predicate reach X is telling us whether some node X can be accessed in one or several steps from node number one. So uh, the base case of the recursion looks like this. If I am in node, in node number one and I make an in step, then X is also reachable. And if X was reachable and I jump from X to Y, then Y is also reachable. As you can see, you don't have the guarantee that one is reachable in the base case because you have to complete the cycle. So you have to come back from somewhere else. So the final step, once we have this uh, auxiliary predicate is saying that it cannot be the case that you have a vertex X that cannot be reached. So this is really, really, really simple. This is the Hamiltonian cycle problem in six lines. Actually, we could remove one, <laughs> but let's, let's uh, uh, treat it with the classical, let's say, implementation of this. Uh, and this is program number 41. So if you can try it with the extensional database using Klingo 0 proc 39, which was the extensional database and proc uh, 41 LP. Well, we have a lot of information here. Um, for instance, we, est we have the extensional database all along, right? Something I already knew that are facts. So I can not maybe just tell Klingo. So it's in seven lines. I can tell Klingo, please show me only predicate in. And we have to write it this way saying the number of arguments you are interested in. I want the version of predicate in with two arguments. And these are the two solutions I get that correspond to the two possible uh, cycles we could form in the graph I had before. One is one, two, four, three, and the other one is one, two, three, four. Of course, as you can see, you don't have a guarantee in the ordering among the edges you get there. They come in any order, but you can reconstruct the path by following the jumps, okay? So this example illustrates the methodology. 
So answer set programming is a problem solving paradigm that looks like this. You have a real world problem. That was the graph I had before. Maybe it's a graph obtained, I don't know, from Google Maps or from something else. So this is going to be data that you extract from somewhere. And the first step is encoding this into predicates you have to choose in order to represent the instance of the problem. I chose uh, VTX and Edge in order to represent this. And this is what we call the extensional database. Right? Plus, I have a separated file where I describe the problem. I tell you how to solve any Hamiltonian cycle problem from any instance. And this is the problem identification is what we call the knowledge base. So you have the extensional database with perhaps several possible instances and one knowledge base talking about how to solve uh, Hamiltonian uh, cycle problems. You get them, you use them with Klingo here, the names of the files are not the same, but okay, you, you write Klingo zero and you use as many files as you need. And then you get answers. You get several possible answer sets. Each answer set, is program is designed is conceived in a way such that the answer set corresponds to a solution to the problem that's the way of thinking so the last step is decoding back if i want to i don't know uh, draw this picture in a python script or maybe print it in a pdf or something else i still have one more step is to decode the predicates i got here into the final object i am interested in in the real world. So this is the, the, the ASP problem solving paradigm. When you compare ASP with Prolog, what happens if you are, for those that already know a little bit of Prolog or maybe more than me, I don't know, but there are several important differences. First, with respect to semantics, as I said before, Prolog has a unique model. When you write down a Prolog program, from the semantic point of view, it, it only has one model, which is called the canonical model. Whereas in ASP, we may have several answer sets, or maybe no one. And this is on purpose, it's not an accident. As I said before, each answer set corresponds to a solution to the problem. So this is a big difference. Second difference, the way in which we solve a problem also changes a lot. One answer set is one solution. There is a one-to-one -one mapping, okay? Well, this is not always true. Sometimes it's part of a solution, sometimes. But in principle, you have to think that 90% of ASP code uh, behaves like this. One answer set is one solution. In Prolog, how would you solve the Hamiltonian cycle problem in Prolog? Very, very probably, you would get the graph in, in a variable, maybe a list of of nodes or something like that. You would have a predicate that you would pass one of the arguments is the graph and you would get the solution in another variable. And this variable maybe is a list. So look, this is quite, quite different, right? First, you rely on the structure of, of, of lists and uh, uh, constructors and things like that. And all the Hamiltonian paths are instances of a, of a same predicate that has always the same tuples true, okay? So it's quite, quite different. You rely on uh, variables more than, than models, okay? Solutions are instances of variables. The computational power, um, ASP in principle is not for NP complete problems or at most sigma 2P when you jump into the disjunctive case. And that's all. If you go farther than that, then you have to use multi-shot ASP or something that compensates that you cannot go far. Right? Whereas Prolog is a full programming language. It's a Turing complete programming language. So any program is a Turing machine, let's say. Any program you can write in any other language, you can write it in Prolog. Uh, of course, one would say, I would go for this, but think that you don't have problems with termination in, in ASP, unless you go into something similar to Prolog, like adding functions. The language type, well, in principle, I would not call ASP a programming language, although the name is answer set programming. If you talk, uh, if you talk with Gelfond, he would call it answer set Prolog. Uh, because 
the word programming may lead to confusion, there is no execution. So it's a programming language where you don't program. <laughs> it's only a specification. You only specify. You cannot go into details on how to um, proceed in several steps, for instance. Or there is, you cannot associate a timestamp to each uh, part of the program, right? Whereas in Prolog, you do program because you have something else. You have a flow control. You know in which order things are going to be tried. You could even associate a timestamp from the CPU with each step. So it is a real programming language, okay? Well, here in the slides, I have put a lot of uh, applications of ASP. They grow and grow and grow. So you can have a look at the literature as well. Uh, and I think that this is a good moment to, to stop. Uh, there are a pair of features I will use later on, but I think it's a good moment to stop to make the break. Um, All right, okay, thank you very much for the first part. So if you want, we can have either a five or a 10 minute break, depending on how tired you may be. <laughs> it's up to you. I don't know, maybe this now is uh, almost 11, I think we could take several parts. Uh, you can abbreviate several parts in, in, uh, in the same atom like this. For instance, if you write house one, two, five, it actually means writing down these five uh, facts. Whereas if you use semicolon inside the arguments of a predicate, it's a, an abbreviated way of writing down all these facts you have below. Yeah, this this uh, feature is called pooling, and it's something I'm going to use later on. Also, I will use uh, constants. So you, you can pass a constant to Klingo in several ways. One way is writing uh, the, the directive const and then the, the value of the constant, or you can do it in the command line using minus C and then the value of the constant. Uh, another two things I will use in, uh, later on in the Lingo is, is something that you also have in Klingo, of course, is, is uh, cardinality constraints. Uh, here, as you can see, you, you use the brackets, so there is a choice. You can choose to do something. You can choose to add friend X, Y, or not. But when you put numbers on the left or on the right of the set, this means that there is a lower bound and an upper bound. Here, in this case, there is no upper bound because there is no number. It meaning that uh, the number of friends you choose is at least two. And at most, if you have a second number here, at most uh, some, other, some other quantity, right? Uh, you have this program in the, in the code. I'm not going to run it because I'm a little bit off of time but it's, it's uh, PROC 47A. So you can see the number of friends you can generate for a given set of persons. And also this is another example of cardinality constraints. I will not run it, but it's program 47B. Here you have to sit C persons in, in each table. You have three tables and three persons per table, nine people. And you have to sit them in the table. So for each table M, as you can see here, you choose to sit three and only three people in the, in the table. So C is the constant three. So the lower bound is three and the upper bound is three. So you have to choose exactly three people to be sitting in the table. And here you have all the constraints like uh, you cannot sit together two people that hates one each other, X hates Y, so you cannot sit them together. And this other constraint is saying that you cannot sit the same person in different tables, okay? Because this rule is only saying you have to put three names in a table, but you could use the same name in different tables. You can try this example too and play with it and see the solutions you generate. Yeah, just remember that in order to get all the solutions, you have to always write Klingo zero. If you just write Klingo without zero, you get one solution. Okay, one more thing I will use is uh, this symbol here, underscore, that is, is an anon anonymous variable. It's a variable, I don't care the name, right? And uh, a second thing I will use is function symbols as constructors, constructors that let me build, for instance, pair of uh, values. Here you have an example. So 
uh, the, the construct of person associates a name with a last name, a first name with a last name. In this case, person is Bill Gates. And I can use this construct as an argument of a predicate. It has to be clear that this, since it is inside a parenthesis, is not a predicate, it's not true or false, but the whole thing, person Bill Gates, is an object. So owns uh, Bill Gates, Microsoft, owns Jeff Bezos, Amazon, sometimes a company owns another company. Here, this is a, a clothing company uh, in Coruña, by the way, in the text is from Coruña. So company Inditex owns the company Sara. So you can see that the argument can change its, its structure depending on the, the constructor you use. Uh, the advantage of this is that sometimes you can inspect anything that is an owner and P will uh, agree with all these uh, possible variables or all these possible uh, elements, company and persons. And sometimes you can use the constructor to inspect any of its parts. For instance, I'm here, I'm collecting all the fa family names I have in my database, Gates and Betsus. Okay. So what about change, actions and change, right? Here you have the song by David Bowie. David Bowie. Um, it is very common that great part of the scenarios in ancestor programming are transition systems. And for those transition systems, you have typical reasoning problems like simulation, explanation, planning, diagnosis, verification. I'm going to put three examples of this, the, this uh, first three, simulation, explanation, and planning. And uh, why is it uh, that we have so much, uh, so many dynamic scenarios in ancestor programming? Because ancestor programming, is a very good uh, formalism for this quality here called elaboration tolerance defined by McCarthy, where small changes in a problem, in a real world problem, you make a small variation in the problem, you would look for a small variation in the specification you have for the same problem, right? If I make a small change in the Hamiltonian cycle problem, I don't know, I add colors, I add weights, or I do something else, this should mean a small change in the representation. And this is one of the most important advantages of ASP with respect to, for instance, uh, SAT encodings, right? Because in, in SAT encodings, small changes normally go into a, a serious reformalization of the problem, right? Typical problems of lab elaboration, these are historical problems that are not a problem anymore, but these are the frame problem, ramification problem, qualification problem. They are not anymore in ASP, right? Uh, for instance, another formalism that is very intuitive is using automata. And automata are very related to transition systems, but I would not specify a system directly uh, writing down an automaton because the automaton is not uh, tolerant at all. Small change may make uh, to rebuild the whole set of states. And this implies, of course, rebuilding the whole set of transitions. And uh, the application of uh, ancestor programming to actions and change uh, follows a methodology already introduced in 1993 by Gelfand and Lifshitz in this paper, representing anterior change by logic problems. It's not that everybody does the things in the same way, but more or less you can find the same spirit in all the encodes you have in ASP. Uh, let's put an example here where we have uh, um, three, three um, switches in a corridor to switch on or off the light. There is a circuit here, maybe the corridor at home, you have three switches. And uh, the fluents are the variables that change a long time. In this case, they are Boolean, the status of the switches. They can be up or down. Uh, the light can be on or off. It's also Boolean fluent. We have the actions toggle one, toggle two, and toggle three to move the switches. We have states. A state is a possible configuration of fluent values. And we also have situations where uh, we, ha we have a, a trace, right? Uh, here we have a trace with at least three states. The first situation is this one. We perform an action, we jump into another situation, and so on. 
in order to make a representation of this system in, in ASP, the first thing we have to do is um, to define how to represent the value of a fluent. I'm going to use this predicate H holds F uh, fluent value, uh, fluent F holds value V at time point. So as you can see, I have uh, written T in red. I always need a temporal uh, argument saying at which point are we talking about? The same, uh, for instance, uh, HSW1 up zero means that the first switch is initially uh, up in zero represent time point zero, right? I will also use predicate O uh, standing for occurs to say that an action A occurs at time point T. This means from T minus one to T. For instance, occurs toggle one in one is this execution here, is we toggle switch one between time zero and one. So when I put a one here, it's actually the transition between zero and one. As I said before, notice that anything that changes along time requires a final argument. Normally we use the final argument, could be any of them, but it requires an extra argument to tell us at which time point we are talking about. This could be a first representation. If we try it in, in, in Klingo, you can see that we have a predicate telling us which are the steps I'm going to make. In this case, it's only from one to two. You could change here 20 or something like that, right? Initially, the switch one is up and I move switch one twice, right? I move, I uh, toggle one at the transition one and toggle one again and transition. And this rule is saying that if the switch was down before in T minus one, and I perform a toggling, then it will be up in T. And this one is saying the opposite. If it was up, it will be down. If we try this program, which is program 55, with Klingo, sorry. You can see that we are moving toggle number one twice. So in situation zero, it was up. In situation one, it is down. And in situation two, it is up again. So we are moving the switch up and down alternative, right? OK, what happens in Telingo? Telingo is an extension of uh, Klingo. And I'm going to explain first, I don't know how much I, can, I will be able to explain. I'm going to explain first the light use of the lingo that is doing what we were doing in ASP in a simpler way. The first thing is that uh, time is going to be implicit. The, the, the temporal argument you saw in red is not going to be there anymore. We are going to remove it. There is no temporal argument. So in principle, our uh, predicates are going to be smaller and also rules are going to be smaller. Uh, but uh, we have to form groups of rules to know uh, the implicit time point. So for instance, we have these four possibilities. When we write program initial, we are talking, these rules are talking about uh, T equal to zero. When we write program dynamic, these are transition rules from T minus one to T. When we write uh, always, it means everywhere at any time point. And finally, when we write final, we are talking about the last time point. We are always uh, considering finite traces, finite narratives. Uh, there are two extra things we are going to do is in dynamic rules, when we want to refer to something in T minus one, we write a comma on the left of the predicate name. And we can also refer to things at time point zero by writing an underscore in front of the predicate. And this is important because, for instance, predicates that do not change a long time, we normally just define them in time point zero and then use the underscore because we don't, we don't care what happens with them after. Moreover, we can also form sequences. By now, we are going to see uh, this way of sequence uh, using this construction here, uh, ampersand tail, and between brackets, I write uh, what happens at each state and semicolon greater than means and then 
So for instance, here in the first state, I'm not required anything in particular. So I just write true. And then uh, I make uh, toggle one, and then I make toggle one again. So the same code we had before for Klingo would look like uh, this for Telingo. As you can see here, the T argument has disappeared. I used the uh, previous construct here. So this comma here is saying that H in the previous state. And here is the sequence of actions I had before. So let me execute pro, uh, program 57, but now using Telingo. Okay. Is 57A. Right? The program 57A now looks like this. We have one answer, but we have something new, right? That the answer has to separate the, the atoms depending on the number of the state. In the state zero, the switch was up. In state one, you perform a toggling and the switch is now down. In state two, you again toggle the same switch and the switch is up. Okay. So let's up, let's add uh, initial facts for switches two and three and see what happens with them. Sorry. So we, we go to program 57A. And here you see that I have commented this line. So here I am adding the initial state also of switch two and switch three, saying that they are also up. So the three switches are up now. I want to see what happens when I move the switch uh, number one. So here correctly, as you can see correctly, um, I have that the three switches are up, but I don't have information about them in the rest of the states. So something that you normally have in a normal logic program, uh, sorry, in a normal programming language is that if a variable is not changed, doesn't change, here yeah, you have to specify that. Otherwise, if there is no specification that something doesn't change, you will not have information about it. So what is missing here is the inertia default. This is a default law that has um, caused a lot of literature in non-monotonic reasoning. And it's very, very easily implemented in answer set programming by using the full negation. Here, this is a version I have uh, included here. There are many versions of the inertia default. This, this is the, perhaps one of the simplest uh, way to read it. Here, I am using an auxiliary predicate that says that fluent F has changed when it had a value V, it has now a value W, and these two values are different, right? Because if B is equal to W, then it hasn't changed. And then the inertia default says, if previously you had value V and the fluent has not changed, then you still have value V. So these two rules have been added in program 57B. As you can see them, they are here. So I have added, the inertia rule, and if you perform the lingo uh, program 57b.lp, now we see that the fluids that had not been touched uh, are still there by default, right? And this inertia rule doesn't have to be modified. You keep it there, and whenever a fluent follows the inertia rule, you don't have to say when the fluent doesn't change. So the frame problem is very easy to solve, as you can see. Uh, okay. Um, this is a full encoding of the domain where I have added things that we are missing before. This is program 58. Uh, I have added, uh, oh, sorry, I have, I have included what happens to the light when you move a toggle, when you toggle a switch. It doesn't matter which switch you toggle, the light has to change the state. And I have also added this rule here that is saying that for any action A, and look, we are using uh, what it has been defined initially. So initially you have actions talk one, two, and three. For any action A, 
choose one of them and only one of them in any state. So the actions are going to be generated non-deterministically. So this is a domain I'm going to use for three different examples of three different kinds of reason. Uh, this is program 58. So the first kind of uh, reasoning problem is simulation. You have the initial state, you perform some toggling, and you look for the intermediate states. This is what we did before, right? This we have just done here. You, I provided the initial state. I said which were the, the actions to be performed, and then I get the result. So for instance, here you have another example of an, insta of an instance of a simulation problem where I, I provide the initial state here using a rule saying that all the switches are up. I provide a different sequence here. I move toggle three, then one, and then two twice and see what happens. Uh, I see something in the chat. Yes. And the order is not important, but it's important that you, you specify which uh, is the kind of rule you are talking about. You can change from program initial to dynamic and then back to initial and then back to dynamic as many times as you want. So somehow uh, this program initial is saying that everything that goes below, below until the next program uh, directive is going to be initial rules. But still, the ordering is not important. You can provide first the, the dynamic rules, then the final rules, and finally the, the, the initial ones. So that, that is not important, right? I hope that this clarifies the situation. So this is program 61. That is an instance of a simulation program. And we can combine it with program 58. So program 58 was the general domain. And program 61 is the particular simulation problem I have on that. And as you can see, I perform toggle three, toggle one, toggle two, toggle two. And we can see what is going uh, on here. Like, uh, the, the, of course, the light is changing from on to off, alternating, because each time you move a, a, a switch, the light changes. But here we can see what happens with the switches. The three moves to down. The one moves to down, the three, sorry, the two moves to down. Now I have the three of them down and uh, toggle two moves switch two to up. So you can follow the simulation, right? This is one possibility, but we have many more possibilities. For instance, another possibility is making temporal explanation. What is a temporal explanation problem? Is kind of a temporal puzzle we have partial observations of the states and perform actions, but not all the information. For instance, I don't know the state of this, this fluence in the initial state. I don't know which action has been performed here. And I don't know this thing. So I have partial information. I would like to generate explanations that could fit with information I have. And this is what we call postdiction or temporal explanation. So here we have a, a postdiction problem where in the initial state, I know that switch three is up and the light is on. In the second state, I know that the light has been off, become off, switch one down and switch three up. I don't know switch two. And in the third state, I know that I have performed toggle. This is the information I have. The interesting thing here is that as you can see, I don't start providing the sequence directly using a tell fat, but instead I write this. It is forbidden that this thing here is false. This is how I should re uh, read it, okay? So I forbid any solution where this is not satisfied. This is quite different of writing the rule like this, because if I write the rule like this, I provide a proof for being uh, for the switch being up. I don't want to provide a proof. I want, I want to check that whatever is proof fits with this observation. And this is why I use a constraint here. So the, the, this time is 63. So rather than 61, I put 63. And this is one possible explanation telling me the full 
distribution of, of atoms in the initial state. But if I want to see whether there are more explanations, I use Telingo zero. And as you can see, I have up to four possible explanations for this scenario. Uh, I'm not going to get into detail with this, but think about it later on and play with it and check what happens, right? And of course, one very important kind of problem that we are very, very interested in ASP, so much interested that there is a whole field about ASP planning, is planning. What happens with planning is, is a bit similar to the temporal explanation, but it has a fixed, let's say, structure. You know the initial state. You are interested in the sequence of actions to get to a goal state. And the goal state can be complete or maybe just uh, partial. For instance, I want to get to a state where the light is on and uh, I don't care about the, the switches. Or maybe I want to get the light on and this configuration of switches and so on. And what I, I have to know is the sequence of actions to get there. For instance, this planning problem could be a possibility. This is the initial state, the light is on and all the switches are up, right? And I want to reach a state where the light is on, but switch one is down, switch up, switch two is up, and switch three is down. I want to get to that uh, situation. How can I do it? Again, I cannot assert this because this would be providing the proof for it. So this would be saying in the final state, the light is on for sure. Instead, what I do is using a predicate saying when the goal is satisfied. So when this happens, goal is true. Another constraint saying that it cannot be the case that the goal is not satisfied. So please check that when you reach the final state, atom goal is true. Okay. And this is program 65. So if we just run the lingo zero program 58, that was the general encoding, plus uh, the particular planning problem I'm uh, talking about, uh, you can see that we can get two different plans. Of course, here I have too much information. I can do as I did before. I can open program 65 and say here, please show me only uh, predicate O, which is of course the actions, right? And here are the two solutions. The, the first solution is that you toggle three first and then you toggle one. And the second solution just changes the order of the two uh, of the two movements. In general, in this scenario, probably if you have a plan, you can change the order, you make permutations of it. Okay, I'm going to skip this because I'm running quite late, I'm afraid. <laughs> and also diagnosis, I'm not going to talk about it. It's interesting, if you are interested in diagnosis, you can have a look at this, uh, at this paper. Mm, and also verification, I'm going to skip on this part, okay. So any questions un until now? Uh, so let's move into time. Sorry. So time, like Pink Floyd uh, song, right? So until now, the things we have made are quite limited. We have four types of rules, initial, dynamic, always, and final. So you can classify rules with any of these tags. You can talk about the previous situation, what happened in the immediately previous uh, state. You can talk about the initial state using the underscore, and you can put sequences. Can we go further? Just to put an example, uh, we have just made a planning problem. And imagine that someone tells me, I don't want plans where um, toggle one occurs after toggle three. Well, it may be a rule, it may be a policy, or it may be something that I don't want to go, the corridor is too long, I don't want to go in, in, in a given direction. So some, someone tells me that from all the possible plans I was generating before, I don't want, uh, is it possible to set atoms in the next situation? Yes, you can put the comma to the right of the atom name, but only in the head, okay? 
And you can use it also in any constraint. Right? That, that was, yes. uh, of course, I'm telling a very small fragment of everything because I don't have so much time. Right? Okay, back to the back to the example. So I want to forbid, I want to choose plans where toggle one does not occur after I made toggle three. If I make toggle three, I cannot do toggle one later on. At which point, I don't know, because maybe I did toggle three in situation number 100, and toggle one cannot appear from there on. So I cannot use the particular numbers, but something I can do, I would do in, in, in ASP to do this is using an auxiliary predicate. Normally, everything is solved by using an auxiliary predicate. It's a little bit true. So one way to do that is uh, this predicate says that toggle three has been moved. But we have to be careful here, right? Because this means toggle three has to be moved. And once this is true, it has to be true forever, right? Because otherwise, I will not remember that move, move three was true before. So I have to add these two rules. Whenever you move toggle three, record it with the auxiliary predicate. But additionally, once this auxiliary predicate is true, it's true forever, right? And then the only thing I have to add is, OK, now forbid that you toggle one when three has been moved. This is program 73. If you add program 73, to exactly what we had before, you will see that now we only have one valid solution. Of course, this is a very small plan. You can play with it in a longer version to see that really uh, it doesn't matter whether where toggle one and toggle three is happening, but it's checking that you never do this before that. Okay, but is there a better way to do this? Because uh, these constructions, these temporal constructions, after, until, while, these are very clear natural language constructs, but using auxiliary predicates forces me to think about which rules I have to use in order to encode this, this meaning, right? And the other solution is going into linear temporal logic. If you are familiar with it, that is perfect. If not, it's not so difficult to learn. And here, uh, we could do it this way. It cannot be the case that you perform toggle three and eventually, at some point in the future, you also perform toggle one. Uh, yeah, another question. Can you look for plans that optimize a specific function? The answer is yes. You can do anything you can do in Klingo. You can minimize, for instance, a, a, a specific predicate, right? So optimization from Klingo moves into here. There are other, other characteristics from Klingo I didn't explain, like aggregates that are very, very useful. You have aggregates here exactly the same as in Klingo. The only thing you don't have it yet is the API access through Python. So you cannot go into Telingo and, uh, from Python and play with it yet. But uh, all the rest you have in Klingo, you have it also in Telingo. After all, Telingo is, is playing on top of Klingo language. Okay, so as you can see, we can use this eventually, any time point in the future, and this, it cannot be the case that you toggle three and eventually you come back to toggle one. So linear temporal logic is, uh, looks like this, is possibly the simplest temporal logic we have. Uh, you have these operators here, actually you could define only a pair of them, but you have the, the boxes means forever, the diamond means eventually, sometime in the future. Uh, the circle means next. And the U means until. Is, uh, the only one that is a binary connective is the until. I don't know why it jumps backwards rather than forward. So good things about linear temporal logic. It has this decidable inference methods. It's P space completes. Its complexity is very well known. There are many computational methods. The, the very well studied relation to other mathematical models in, from theoretical computer science. You have a huge literature on this relation to algebra, relation to automata, relation to formal languages. So it's very, very well studied. It, is, it can be seen also as a fragment of first order logic, 
linear temporal logic exactly coincides with monadic first order logic with an order in relation. This was the main result from Kant's uh, thesis in 1968. You have very good computational tools for model checking, uh, verification on reactive systems. And also, it's not only used in theoretical computer science, it's also used in the artificial intelligence. You have uses of LTL in planning, in ontologies, multi-agent systems. So it's very, very well known. So I uh, encourage you, for those that don't know linear temporal logic, you have a look into it. The bad thing is that linear temporal logic is monotonic. So you will always have the frame problem. So I said before, the frame problem has been overcome in non-monotonic reason, but in, in linear temporal logic, you have to solve the frame problem all the time. So which is the immediate idea is combining both things, combining equilibrium logic and linear temporal logic into what we call temporal equilibrium logic, which has the synthesis of linear temporal logic, but has the semantics of equilibrium models. Um, well, this is something I said before. There are other two operators here. I will not comment because we are running out of time, but um, how does the temporal here and there semantics look like? In linear temporal logic, an interpretation is a sequence of sets of atoms. Here, you see in time point zero, maybe P and Q are true. In time point one, maybe P. In three, all of them are false and so on. So it's like a movie, right? You have several uh, frames at different time points. Well, you may imagine that in temporal here and there, you have several here and there pairs. So remember the, the pairs, right? We have the assume and the proof part at zero, the assume and the proof part at one, and so on, so on, so on. So that you build this trace where at time point one, you have two components, H1, which is included in T1, H2, included in T2, and so on. Uh, okay, sometimes one of the components is strictly smaller, right? And then we write that the component H is strictly smaller than T. The semantics is completely orthogonal. When you play with Boolean, Connectives you use here and there. So it's the same as before. The only thing is that you have to tell me the time point in which you check things. So this means that alpha is proof at time point i. And this means that alpha is assumed at time point i. So like before, uh, Boolean connectives are exactly as before. As you see, the implication has the two parts. It has to be assumed, and it also has the, let's say, modus ponens part. When an atom is checked, it has to be checked at the time point where you are looking at, and in the H component as before. And when you move into the temporal connectives, it's completely orthogonal. You don't do anything with the H T pair. You only play with the I time point. So next is just moving to the next step forever alpha is if you are at this point you drag alpha uh, all the time uh, to the future eventually alpha you have to place alpha at some uh, future time point or maybe now and the until is that you keep repeating alpha until you get a point where the stopping condition beta becomes true okay i'm going to skip the rest of things the release and the while because i think we are Oh, we should always be done, right? <laughs> what is a temporal equilibrium model? A temporal equilibrium model is a classical model, right? So it is a linear temporal uh, logic model where T is equal to H is equal to T. And there is no way to find a smaller H. So it's exactly the same definition we have before. The only thing is that now you start uh, checking models at time point zero. And we say that T alone is a temporal stable model of a temporal uh, theory, right? Uh, these are a pair of examples I normally use, but I would like to show you an example in the lingo. So I'm going to skip a great part of, of, the, of, of the slides. So we have several tools for, for playing with uh, temporal equilibrium logic. This tool upstem allows computing temporal stable models for infinite traces. 
but normally we are more interested, especially when we are doing problem solving, we want to get solutions to a problem rather than studying properties of a domain. Uh, in that case, the, the solutions have to be finite, Other, otherwise you, you cannot deal with them properly, right? So the lingo focuses on finite traces, is closer to practical uh, problem solving. And the syntax in the lingo goes like this. You can write the temporal formula inside the tail construct, inside the brackets. The next is the greater than. This is the weak next. It means that if there is a next step, then P. Uh, this is eventually, this is forever. As you can see, you have always, all the future oper operators use the greater than. So eventually has a question mark in forever has a star. Uh, these two operators can be used uh, as unary operators or as binary operators. When they are used as binary operators, the eventually is an until. Right? And as you see in the, in the right column, you have the same operators, but using lower down. In these are operators that do the same function, but towards the past. So if this means next P, this means previously P. So this is the same as putting the comma on the left. This is the same as putting the comma on the right. If this says eventually P, this says at some point in the past, P was true. And if, if this says always P, this says P has always been true until now and so on, okay? Uh, we also have the Boolean connectives and true and false. So just to put an example, maybe we can end here. I have a more complicated example later on, but maybe we can end here. Just to put the example of, uh, I want to forbid that at any point in the future, you perform toggle three. And after that, you see that you have an X and then eventually, you perform toggle one. So I want to forbid any trace, right? Any trace that at any point, eventually, right? So this eventually here is saying that at any point you perform toggle one, sorry, toggle three. And then later on, I don't know how many situations, but at least from the next one to at some point, I perform toggle one. This is something I want to forbid. And this is what we have here. It is forbidden that this is the, the first eventually. I perform toggle three. And, and next is this thing here. Maybe it's, it's clear if, if we just write it this way. And, and then next, eventually toggle one. So this is program 90 that you can combine. with the base program that is 58. And as you can see, well, in program 90, we don't have the show thing, but you, we only get the solution where one goes before three and not after, right? So the good thing here is that there is no auxiliary predicate anymore. You can use any expression in linear temporal logic to play with the plans that satisfy you more. Or you can use them also in rules. You can use past operators in the bodies of rules to check what has happened before, but using temporal logic rather than talking about the specific time points. I think um, I'm going to stop here and open uh, questions rather than going into the full detail. I don't know if you want me to skip to conclusions. So maybe I think it's better to open uh, uh, questions and. Uh, and finish the presentation here.